Victor Harrison 他是德国联邦经济事务专员 Armida Sarsia Alijabana, Tashi Lian Hagua, Fu Mishu Zhang, Tung Shi Shi, Yatai Jinji Shi Hui Wei Hui, Zhishin Mishu, Zhijing the Huan Ying, Yi Xiao Zhun Xian Shen, Shi Mao Zhu Zhi Fu Zhong Gang Shi, Zhijing the Huan Ying. Daniel Trulilo, Tashi, Warma, Fuji Shinzong Tai, Tongshi Shi, Chuancho Shoshi, Dedao Gangshi, He Gui Guang, Zhijingde, Huan Ying Jinlian Marcel, Tashi Resilience Capitan, Virgin LLC, Dancing Fencing Tozu Gongsi, the Chuan Zhao Ren. 呃，最近的欢迎穆基塞古杜伊是贸易和发展会议秘书长。叶黄莹，呃，Ed Anderson先生，呃，他是国际货币基金组织首席信息官和信息技术部门主任。呃，现在我们身处很严重的疫情之中，所以经济。受到这个新冠状病毒的影响，我们今天无无法直接呃见面，必须通过呃这个技术呃通信的手段呃进行我们的会晤。因此呢，今天我们要多谈这些设计技术方面的数字技术方面的问题，呃数字贸易等等。我们都知道数字技术它连接到普通的经济领域或者社会领域同时使用这些技术需要考虑很多安全技术安全问题我们在这个年底我们经 联合国秘书发表了一个互联网路线图，想要普及数字化。因此呢，我们有这个呃高级别的会议，呃，为了能够更好的嗯，声讨各种各样的呃互联网相关的政策，然后。想一想，我们在呃疫情之后，呃经济恢复的时期之内，怎么能够利用这些新技术？现在我希望要求呃每个发言者打开麦克，然后我们会交换一点，请各位记住，我分配给你们三分钟的时间。所以现代表给对于先代表 
负面后果，然后你觉得哪个领域需要给他呃这个受药呃。呃，这个词用呃意大利语很难说。首要、重要性是什么？是真的欢迎各位。这个新冠状病毒对经济和社会，呃，在非洲有很大的影响。最重要的经济，这个对经济的呃影响。是，呃，四四点九，百分之四点九到百分之两点九，这是我们的非洲联盟的，嗯，对经济损失的，呃，这样的一个预测。我们觉得我们有六百五十万，呃，有六六百五十亿美元的损失。同时呢，在很多呃国家，有些平常的价格呃下降了，然后呃价价格喷嗯喷涨，呃也有呃很明显的这个趋向。另外呢，外商投资对呃非非洲国家的援助呃也减少了，同时呢。我们的支出提高了，因为医疗呃服务呃造成一定的承担，呃一定的负担。同时呢，我们有呃这个食物的危机，呃我们的食物呃产量减少了百分之六七，所以我们的呃这个工业产量呃也。减减低，呃，因此呢，经济增长，呃，无论是呃农嗯农村这个农产品生产，或者是工业生产，或者是旅游，所有的领域就呃感到这个疫情的影响，负面影响。我们不只是在医疗方面，呃，有一些问题，很多问题，但是我。呃有些经济和社会，呃，改变导致我们的贫穷的风险提高了。呃，涉及到你的问题，我们去年报告，呃，经济和社会后果，就是大呃流行病毒在非洲的呃这个后果的报告，然后我们就包含，呃。一个一一种信息，我们就是说，数字技术可以帮我们呃减少这些负面的影响。我觉得数字化在非洲的利用，肯定可以带来一些变变嗯变一些变更，呃，这些变更可以比较和我们的去过去的呃工业革命，所以。我觉得，如果想要执行这个目标，如果想要在呃非洲普及呃低费用的呃低费用的互联网呃接入呃能力，那我们可以呃得到呃经济增长百分之二。我们现在在非洲面临呃经济转型的问题，但是我们还有。还有一些积极的倡议，我们比较快的在那个农民行业，比方说在尼吉利亚、在肯尼亚有一定的成就，另外呃，加梅隆啊、肯尼亚有一定的医疗系统方面的成就，很多呃国家已经开始利用呃呃数字技术，防止病毒的扩散。呃，马达加斯卡，它有一个数字平台，呃，可以跟踪呃患者，就是得病的一定干扰者。另外，呃，在我们的教育方面，我们也有在埃及或者是在南在南非，呃，可以看到呃明显的呃结果。
，在我们的数字经济方面，我们也有呃很突出的呃这个保守性的呃成就。我们在非洲有一个非洲计划，然后从二零。二一年一月开始，我们会有一些新的解决方案，呃，以便把我们的贸易地区啊，就是扩大百分之十五到到二十五。我们也希望通过呃执行这个计划，可以改善呃贸易合作，也可以建造一个嗯、呃、这个数字。呃，贸易平台，呃，加快呃非洲的经济创新，因为这个创新现在还没利用，呃，还没充充分的利用。非常感谢你初初步介绍给我们一些所可能的呃非洲可以采可以采取的措施。呃，你说我们。呃，非洲和欧洲的情况完全不一样。你们要呃脱穷，呃呃，现在我们想要了解一下德国，他德国的情况，疫情怎么影响到德国？呃，数字解决方案，呃，在德国怎么样？你们对未来的呃预测是如何？女士们、先生们，大家好。呃，我觉得，呃，在在德国，我们呃，我们在德国这个这个经济发展，让我们觉得从呃在开始它是一个问题，但是最后它就变成一个促进电子化的一个促进化。呃，在呃在德国最大的网络公司，它的总部位于这个法兰克福，而且按照它的数据，这个。呃，这个数据输送的呃输送量，它提高了很多，就是最近几个月的，呃，这个，呃，这个，这个，这个，传送呃量是就是提高的非常非常厉害，所以到现在我们没有遇到呃太大的呃网络基础设施的灾难。所以就是说，我们发现，呃，这个这个我们网络设施是足够的。但是除了这个之外，我们还发现，在我们呃这个电子教育方面，我们碰到了一些一些问题，而且让我们呃明白我们在这个方面还有一些一些缺点。呃，除了这个之外，我们呃我们觉得一个重要的事情就是说，这些小中企业在这个呃危机当中。他们自己决定要呃要改善他们电子化，所以我们呃德国政府决定呃对这些中小呃中小企业呃就是给他们提供一些免税的政策，因为目前我们呃我们德国的消费者他们他们要求公司提供所有的服务，就是提供任何服务。要求都是都是可以电子提供的，而且德国的政府也是也是支持这个这个做法。当然，我们呃我们的重要的一件事情就是跟踪跟踪我们的老百姓，就是说关于这个跟这个病的接触。如果我们没有这个电子技术呢，我们没办法跟踪这些我们知道是病例的那些人。所以我觉得。呃，这个网络和和电子化会呃在打击这个疫情冲突，发挥非常重要的作用。但是我们必须要在这方面呃做出一些一定的呃一定的投资，呃，这是这是第一件事儿。但是我们做投资的同时，我们必须要保证呃我们投资的结果，所有的人都可以使用，呃。在德国，很多人，呃，就是把，呃，我们的人口的大多数，他们在使用一个跟踪的的应应用，呃，每两秒钟有人下载这个这个应用，这是非常重要的。还有呃一个方面，就是说，呃，我们在这个呃大流行的时期，我们发现，呃。
电子教育不只是可能的，而且也是非常有效的。呃，之前我们呃我们感觉我们呃我们明年不会有什么呃经济的改善，但现在我们因为这些所有的措施，我们觉得还是会更好的。呃，丹尼尔，非常感谢。你提到了在呃在德在德国越来越多消费者感觉所有的服务必须可以以电子形式提供的，呃这是非常好的事情。所以现在我想问呃阿米达萨拉西亚阿里阿里沙巴纳，他是呃联合国的呃副秘书，他负责亚洲和南太。呃，所以如果我们说创新，呃，就是电电电子的创新，它是非常领先的一个地区。但是除了这个之外，也就是在这个地区，这个呃，这个电子鸿沟，它它呃它它是越来越大。所以我想问一下，呃呃，是是是是呃，这个目前的大流行是否让这个鸿鸿沟也更更为严重？呃，所以我想问你，呃，呃，想想问你，你们打算如何解决这个问题？呃，非常感谢马克，这个这个问题很有道理。呃，女士们、先生们，大家好。呃，所以呃，这个这个这个问题取决于我们地区的一些特征。我们呃，我们这个地区就是亚洲和南太，它是呃有很多不同的国家组成的，呃，所以多样化程度是非常高的。所以如果我们谈这个电子连接性或者电子鸿沟，呃，那这个这个在每个国家呃每个国家都不一样的。我们可以说这里有呃三个速度，呃，这个所有的国家分三个速度。呃，首先，呃，我们我们有一些一些比较发达的国家，呃，所以在那些比较发达的国家，他们呃，他们我们可以说他们在电子电子数据化是是比较领先的国家，呃，所以这些国家他们呃不只是有四 G， 呃呃也有五 G， 而且现在在发展呃六 G 的的网络。而且网络的使用在那边是非常普遍的，也是也是成本比较低的，而且这个网络这个连接的数呃的质量是是比较可靠的。第二组就是呃中中中收入的国家，呃所以在我们地区大多数都是这个中中收入的国家，呃或者上中收入的国家，呃所以在这些国家我们呃。我们能够看到一个一个非常动态的的的情况，他们对这个鸿沟，呃，就是图，就是解决这个鸿沟的问题的进步是非常呃非常明显的。而且第三组国家，呃，就是那些从网络方面比较比较比较差的那些国家，而且按照。最最终的，而而按照最近的一些数据，呃，在全世界有呃有呃三十个亿呃人口，他们到现在没有网网络呃的连接，而且这些人的很大的部分就就在我们地区，呃。那嗯那些最不发达的国家或者。或者这些岛的国家、小岛的国家，那边这个宽带网络，他们是是几乎没有，或者或者如果有呢，这个这个成本是非常高的。呃，所以是所以如果我们谈这个电子鸿沟，呃，那这个就已经变成了一个政策问题。呃，而且我们必须要在我们呃考虑政策的时候，我们必须要考虑如何我们能够。呃，减少这个这个电子鸿沟。呃，所以呃，解决这个这个电子鸿沟的问题的解决方案之一，就是建造这些网络基础设施
呃，那是我们也要支持这些国家，呃，在这方面进行深度筹划，呃，因为呃，如果那些国家不能呃尽快呃解决这个呃网络接入的问题，那他们会越来越落后。所以我们在这个这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这这
uh, uh, cutting the number of robots in your hypermarkets and going back to have more people in the supermarkets. So basically, maybe this is one of the reactions, but uh, uh, what's your response uh, actually to the current pandemic crisis? Thank you very much and good morning, everyone. And thank you for the opportunity to be part of the forum with this group of selective, uh, selective uh, leaders. So I would like to touch uh, three key aspects. Uh, one is the e-government e deficit. The other one is the potential that we see. And, and lastly, I would like to talk about license permitting. Uh, you know, COVID-19 has unmasked the huge deficit in digitalization of government services, many of which have been largely paralyzed during periods of remote work because of over-reliance in paper and in-person steps. Yet, uh, COVID-19 has also shown uh, that rapid acceleration of e-government is every bit as possible as it is urgent and important for us. In our own experience in the private sector, we, our customers, suppliers, and other stakeholders have found uh, ways of hugely uh, accelerating digitalization of our own ways of work and customer proposition. We know it can be done. We are now resources in helping governments get up that curve quickly as well. In terms of licensing and permitting, within e-government digitalization of license and permitting must be the highest priority right now. There are three key aspects why uh, we think that way. First, uh, across all governments, a stimulus in the form of deficit spending and monetary easing may be reaching its limit. So what is more needed, most needed at this point uh, is private sector funded shovel ready investment projects. This is exactly what is being held up by huge COVID era uh, delays in lays and private systems, for example. Any e-government will influence corporate investment planning over the medium term but digital license permit is about unlocking investment projects that have been already approved and which are just waiting on permits before shovels break the ground. Second, uh, direct and indirect users of license permit systems include the entire public and private residential housing market, as well as corporate real estate, architecture and engineering firms, and almost any business. Um, so, that, that is, that is uh, any business that is seeking to grow. So, I mean, digitalization of license and permits uh, helps get a critical mass of public and private sector users to adopt digital tools, uh, making it an on-ramp into a massified digital economy. Uh, third and lastly, uh, license and permit systems have historically been plagued by corruption. Uh, digital licensing and permitting ensures more efficient and reliable provision of public services and limits opportunities for corruption by strengthening uh, transparency and accountability. In short, digitalization of uh, license and permit systems must be a top priority right now for COVID-19 recovery and resiliency. Um, this is, uh, this is something that is key uh, and, and good for both public and private uh, governance. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, talking about uh, what governments and uh, public institutions and global institutions can do, uh, I would like to give the floor to Mukiza Kutui, which is the Secretary General of ANCTAD. And of course, my question would be again, uh, how can an ethical and efficient use of technology uh, provide us with a solution to mitigate the emergency in the digital divide? But we have had from the floor uh, a question from Wolfgang, who, who, who's asking uh, a comment on global digital taxation, whether it would be good or bad. And possibly, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Kutui, this is something that you can comment. Well, thank you very much. And I want to thank the brilliant panelists for very refreshing ideas that they've shared with us. Uh, in dealing with the ethical, the practical, the challenges for development today, uh, we have been trying to look at uh, 
what are the intrinsic challenges that are, are deriving from the pandemic? And how has the pandemic magnified challenges that were already pre-existing? Uh, a number of things come clear, as has come through from the others. The major digital giant platform companies have been the main beneficiaries of uh, the economics of the pandemic. Uh, as you could see, while the Dow Jones, Dow Jones uh, index was down 5% over the first, over the, the six months between March and September this year, uh, JD value went up 100%. Companies like Amazon, Apple, eBay, Tencent, Microsoft, and uh, Alibaba, their businesses gained between 40 and 50% in that period. So there's no doubt that uh, the stress for some has really been a, a gift for many digital businesses. And which just brings us to the main challenge. Those who are already not prepared for the digital economy, have been further set back in the challenges. I just want to share with you some uh, recent study we did. We carried out a survey in 23 developing countries asking businesses and government what have been the main challenges of the rising significance of digital inclusion and, di and, and digital business during the pandemic. Now, 50% of the respondents from the business community were saying that the high costs of broadband services, which pre-existed the pandemic, became particularly important at the time when they had to transform more of their businesses online. Secondly, that in countries where governments have lagged behind in creating priority for e-commerce, you still have uh, the dinosaur issues of infrastructure, of policy priorities, the absence of clear regulatory framework, the absence of a clear policy and consistency on tax. Now on tax at this level, there's another side that has not been mentioned, which is because of the pressure for stimulus and public uh, revenue authorities having major squeezes in uh, raising taxes normally, we are seeing growing attention to further taxing of digital businesses, not just in the volume of services being offered, but digital startups facing entry point challenges because of the desire for more public revenue. And this is going to be a condition to survive for some time. But there was also another pre-existing condition which has been exacerbated. The absence of harmony between growing e-commerce potential and fiscal logistics for cross-border movement of goods. I come from East Africa where there has been significant growing capacity for online purchase of goods. Unfortunately, you find physically, because of the absence of clear protocols on cross-border movement of trucks with goods that have been electronically procured. For example, if you go to the border between Kenya and Uganda, you find trucks going back more than 50 kilometers in a queue because of the ambiguity of customs clearance, but more importantly, a credible procedure on health protocols at the border. So these uh, non-digital challenges of logistics of a digital economy have been exacerbated, have been brought in clear light by the crisis we've gone through. Now, if I may just come back to the question you asked specifically about taxation. You remember in our World Digital Economy Report 2019, we had mentioned the unequal relationship between countries which are the drivers of digital, digital business and countries which are only included primarily as digital consumers. So the developmental challenge is how can consumers have something whether it's service or any other form of gain beyond being consumers of a service that is now predominating uh, the digital space. This is very much related to the challenges of what is fair taxation. Unfortunately, the world has not structured these depend, debates adequately. It is hostage to pressures that have affected multilateralism, particularly rule making at WTO, at other levels, a hostage to technology competition between giant countries, which even threatened to spill over into fracturing digital governance, I mean, uh, internet governance issues, as uh, is well known to all of you. But we have a number of specifics that the ongoing discussions about 
how to apply the ad minimis rule on the packages of digitally procured goods. How much is that fair to countries which look at this as opportunities missed to raise some taxation on imports? Challenges on uh, taxation of, uh, I mean, the value of data that is monetized by digital platform companies should benefits go partly to the sources of that data that is being modernized, uh, being uh, uh, commercialized. And of course, the question of uh, pride pricing of duty on cross-border trade because of digital economy. I think this conversation has come to a point where the traditional interlocutors are insufficient from a development perspective. Increasingly must look to hear the voices of the most vulnerable trying to catch up and the most excluded in the benefits even when they are online with broadband. And I think that's uh, how I will respond to this. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thanks a lot. I mean, the point you raised about uh, digital customs, I think it's a crucial one, but it depends very much on, on digital education. So it's, it's, it's again, it's the beginning and, and, and the end of the story at the same time. So it's, it's definitely need a public effort to do this, but also investments. And, 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 and Dr. Marcel, you are the founder and managing member of, of, of the Resilience Capital Ventures. You, you, your job is to uh, uh, see that money gets invested in, 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 uh, in the emerging markets and uh, to foster growth and, and, and foster uh, a, a, a better life for everybody. So I, I was wondering, again, if you can tell us how can uh, how can digital technologies in, in, from a point of view uh, help the world, especially the emerging markets and, and, the, and, and, and the less lucky part of the world to cope with the COVID-19 pandemic? Thank you so much. And uh, I hope that you can hear me well. Uh, I want to I want to thank the the other um, panelists who have laid out many of the structural areas very well. And to speak specifically to your points about investment, I want to make a couple points. First of all, I think that the COVID-19 pandemic has very clearly identified the structural uh, differences and variations across the world. And so the economic crisis that has come in the wake of COVID-19 has not been equal. And so for emerging markets and emerging countries where there was little participation in the digital economy, the crisis would have exacerbated that, those difficulties. However, that decoupling of the digital economy from what is happening in the real economy is also very clearly being seen also in countries like the United States and perhaps also in Europe. But particularly in, uh, in the United States and the Secretary General of UNCTAD made reference to this, where you've had a decoupling of the very large players in the digital economy having had actually having had their market value increase significantly while there is considerable crisis in many other parts of the society and the economy. And I think that that is mirrored on a global scale. So what we find around the world is we find that the crisis has shown up the structural imbalances uh, across the world. Where I think that there is room for some optimism is that we've also seen tremendous flows of investment funds, capital being allocated into ESG and responsible investment funds. What we have not seen, and this comes to my hope for policy recommendation coming out of this, is that we have not seen a step up and an acceleration in blended finance models. So blended finance being not only the combination of private sector capital flows and public finance, but also increasing the emphasis on other forms of capital other than financial capital. 
And so if we had that sort of approach led perhaps by the UN system and other members of the international development community, we would be able to tackle the fact that even before the COVID-19 pandemic, all technologies are socially constructed. And so we should not be surprised. We only have to go back to the history of looking at digitalization, whether it's missing links from the ITU, whether it's knowledge societies from uh, Robin Mansell, where the UNCTAD had a very important role to play, to understand what have we missed in the last 20 years in not anticipating that we would have these kinds of digital divides. And also no one has yet mentioned that there is a gender divide. And so the, the ways in which the digital divide shows up is not gender neutral. And so I would expect that UN women and uh, having played such an important role 20 years ago would be involved in developing any of the proactive solutions that this group and others may come up with in terms of how do we go forward. Just one uh, further point, I am encouraged also by seeing different forms of multi-stakeholder partnership. I'm, I'm particularly encouraged by something called the Green Economy Coalition that is looking at ways of ensuring that even the stimulus funds that are, uh, have been uh, you know, put forward in developed countries are used well, but with a view to having that done with a, uh, an ethical basis and also uh, having regard to inclusivity. So I think that there is on one side, there is crisis and there's pain, but if we harness the intensity of this moment, there is also an opportunity to learn from it and to produce some of the policy changes that have been uh, you know, called for, for some, for some decades. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Marcel. And it appears from what you all say that uh, the COVID-19 pandemic have been uh, uh, drawing some dividing lines, increasing differences and increasing imbalances. So is a good moment to ask Mr. Anderson from the IMF about these differences and about the role that uh, technology uh, did play and is playing during this crisis, especially uh, related to the fact that now we have changed the way we are working. We are mostly working from home. And so there's a new relation, a new way of working. So. Uh, how can we uh, be helped by technology, uh, uh, Dr. Anderson? Well, first of all, thank you, uh, Marco, and also greetings to the other panelists. As the IMF's managing director has said many times, quote, digitalization is the big winner of the crisis, end quote. Uh, it's important to realize that the crisis has three phases. One, countries had to reduce uh, the amount of the lockdown measures and many are now back in this stage. Two, they have to recover from the crisis. And three, as they're doing so, they have to build a more resilient economy. Technologies, of and of course the internet, are playing a different role for each phase. For phase one, as many of my co-panelists have explained, those who had access to the internet have been less impacted thanks to e-commerce, remote working, remote education, or digital payments. It's clear that while digitalization was an aspiration before the crisis in many of the least developed countries, it's now a necessity to get out of this crisis and become more resilient to future shocks. But instead of repeating what others have said on the benefits of technology, let me share some observations on the new digital risks and limitations that we've noted. Technology has not helped everyone equally. In every country from the USA to Ghana, the crisis has shown the significant negative impact of the digital divide, meaning those who have access to the internet compared with those who don't, those who can afford it, those who know how to use it, et cetera. Countries now uh, must now concentrate their efforts to provide connectivity to the hardest uh, populations to reach physically, economically, uh, or to access those who, uh, those with digital and financial literacy constraints. Second, as you know, women have been particularly impacted during the crisis, and Dr. Marcel noted this as well. 
because they often have jobs that are not teleworkable. And more often than men, they tend to take care of the children who stay at home, and especially now stay at home. Uh, countries like Togo or Pakistan, for example, have recognized this issue and have used mobile phones to prioritize their cash transfer programs to women. This is an example of smart digital policy that makes sense economically. Finally, more digitalization and more internet services introduces more digital risks. Managing digital risks cannot be an afterthought. We, the international community, public and private sector, have a responsibility to build uh, forward a better world that is safe, robust, and sustainable. Cybersecurity comes to mind, of course, but that's not all. We also have to prevent further digital divide or the concentration of digital power and data will remain in the hands of a limited number of big tech companies. Privacy also becomes more critical than ever as we produce more data in this new digital world. Thank you. Well, thanks. We are running a little bit late on schedule, but I think this is acceptable. And uh, uh, you just said, uh, uh, Mr. Anderson, that the big winner of the crisis is, is digital. But is it? Because soon after you underlined the problems that we are facing right now. And uh, this is why I, I invite you to, to explore now, to see what the role of the internet and, and, and the public digital policies can be in order to try to solve the problems you all been underlining so far, because things are getting better, but they are not working as, as well as we would expect. We've seen how many people are not connected, how many people are, have a bad line. Even here in Torino, I have a colleague who must come to the office every day because in his area, the connection is bad. And I'm talking about uh, uh, the, the northwestern part of Italy, which is supposed to be uh, rich and happy. So uh, the, second, the, the second session will be about this. I invite you again to try to uh, uh, respect, when possible, the three minutes uh, uh, ceiling for the conversation. And I will start again with Mr. Harrison from the African Union. And Mr. Harrison, uh, after you heard all this, uh, what would you ask uh, all of the stakeholders, the international institution, uh, uh, to, to help you in order to have a better economic uh, uh, recovery? Or to put it bluntly, is there a silver bullet to help Africa? Thank you. Uh, regarding IGP areas of cooperation, I will make three points, which seems to me particularly important. One, infrastructure. The development of digitalization cannot fall filed unless Africa address its sizable deficit in digital infrastructure. But you know, this is a big investment. Two, education. Education systems need, need to be remodelated by investing in education and rescaling programs for both basic and advanced digital skills to make sure African youth are employable and equipped especially for the post COVID era in which digital skills will be at the core of many occupations. Three, macroeconomic and fiscal tools. Digital technology should be expanded to macroeconomic and fiscal policy tools to provide a host of digital solutions for economic 
transformation on the continent. As I mentioned earlier, a digital transformation strategy for Africa has been developed and adopted. And some initiatives have been taken to harness digital technologies and innovation to transform Africa's societies and economies, promote Africa's integration, generate inclusive economic growth, stimulate job creation, erase the digital David, David and eradicate poverty to secure the benefits of digital revolution for social economic development. In this regard, the development of cooperation between stakeholders should be aligned of this framework and pursue the existing initiatives. And the framework for cooperation between stakeholders should be aligned with this continental strategy and continue the initiatives carried out. I thank you. Well, thanks to you. And we see that the African problem is, 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 is relevant. But also in Germany, there were troubles, as, as, as in most of the European countries, in all of the European countries, there were troubles because of, of, of the COVID uh, uh, virus, the coronavirus, and, and generally experienced a, a, a big drop in, in, in the GMP. And, uh, and even if uh, uh, Dr. Uh, um, Dr. Bronstrup says us that in, in Germany there was no, no failure, which is something that we would expect for Germany, on the other hand, uh, not all went uh, in, in, in the right direction. So I was wondering, is there something high tech that you missed? And what's the lesson you could draw from this very difficult months and year? Thank you. Yes, you're completely right. Of course, uh, we uh, ran into economic trouble, as I mentioned before, due to the crisis. Um, and it's very difficult to estimate right now how that will go on, but um, right now we are quite optimistic. And this is also due to the fact that the German government uh, acted very quickly uh, in helping especially companies that have been affected by the crisis with the aim also to safeguard jobs, of course. Um, the German parliament decided on an assistance package of historic proportions. And uh, after that, um, because that was only the first step, we decided to invest much more in future technologies. Dr. Marcel asked for that right now. And I think that's, that is an important point. We will have uh, to look into the future when overcoming the crisis. And that is why we will invest in future technologies. And that is true for green technologies, but also for digital technologies, like, for example, investments in artificial intelligence, in a competitive European AI network, um, in the construction of two quantum computers in Germany, investments in the 5G network, investments in future communication technologies, but also in the automation in public administration. You mentioned that before, that it is very important for the citizens that uh, public services digitalized. That's, that's a view that we really share. So we are now confident that the program will help Germany to emerge from the crisis with renewed strength, but we will have to do that homework, of course. Thanks. Thanks, and danke. Um, of course, uh, heavy investments uh, can be a, a, a right solution but still, sometimes you got to know and you got to have the right know-how in order to uh, uh, know where you got to put the money. Because if you just put money in the wrong project, the effect will be uh, uh, non-existing, if not negative. So uh, again, uh, uh, and, uh, Armida Ali Shabana and uh, uh, Asia and Pacific, uh, uh, in, we, we've been discussing investments and projects. Could you uh, 
could you share with us some of the initiative uh, that you uh, planned and, and organized uh, in order to have a contribution to the digital transformation of the economic sectors? I mean, what was your, we've seen what Germany did and what was your action? Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the question on the uh, specific maybe yeah, initiative that ESCAP has been supporting our member states and uh, stakeholders in our region. I can share uh, a few of these. Uh, for example, yeah, one, uh, at the request of the Pacific Island countries, and uh, as we know that uh, the, the Pacific is one of the uh, part of the region in, in Asia Pacific that are uh, in terms of this accessibility and in internet and so on is still yeah, under, uh, under, under uh, investment. Uh, therefore, ESCAP undertook an in-depth study that uh, recommended the establishment of the so-called shared internet exchange point between three countries, in this case, Fiji, Samoa, and New Zealand. And this will, of, of course, uh, dramatically improve internet accessibility, not only accessibility, but a quality uh, across these, these countries. And hopefully, this initiative can be scaled up to other countries in that part of the region. Uh, second example is the cross-border paperless trade facilitation. This is an agreement, uh, member states in Asia Pacific, uh, which will enter into force uh, early next year, early 2021. So the idea is uh, how to have uh, a trade, yeah, but um, uh, uh, through a digital trade. Yeah. So all the documentation and so on is being fully uh, dig digitalized. Therefore, uh, there will be quite significant reduction yeah, in terms of trade costs uh, around let's say 10 to 30 percent of the existing transaction costs so therefore this will further facilitate uh, the, the, the the trade yeah um, another example the third example is scaling up digitalization as well as uh, some concrete efforts along um, the asian highway network yes yeah, so the asia pacific uh, the asian highway network uh, this is uh, in terms of transport uh, connectivity, yeah. But then, of course, because of this uh, COVID nineteen pandemic, then how, yeah, uh, we we can ensure facilitate uh, the the uninterrupted cross border freight transport movement. So therefore, this uh, part of this is how to digitalize, yeah, uh, a part of the process uh, for the cross border uh, uh, freight movement. So these are a few of the examples that we at SCAP are working and, uh, with member states and to support them, uh, especially in times of this COVID-19, how to mitigate yeah, the socioeconomic impact, as well as how to facilitate several of the, uh, the, the you know, like cross-border uh, uh, trade and so on uh, to be uninterrupted. Thank you. Well, thank you, Secretary. And this is the kind of solutions you've been looking for countries that uh, seems to be far away, like, 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 like Fiji, but they still deserve uh, as much as all the other countries and the effort must be done. Um, the fourth industrial revolution with which we are living now and has been in a way uh, contaminated by COVID-19. And uh, that drives us to the necessity of, of finding uh, uh, um, solutions for a very important problem, which is the managing of data. Uh, the modern economy is built on, on data, and more and more and more data are flowing around the world. So, Mr. He, uh, you are Deputy Director General of the WTO, the trade organization. And uh, I, I wonder whether you can help us in understanding how can we manage uh, all, all, all this data and how can we protect them? Because having the possibility to, to have a free flow of data is, is very helpful for the world economy. But on the other hand, 
the protection of, of privacy and the rights of the citizens uh, and of the companies is capital. So is there any advice, any plan you're working with and you can share with us? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marco, for this question. The discussions at the WTO since the start of the health crisis have helped governments better understand what is at stake in the global digital economy and the movement of data. In this respect, our e-commerce e talks have probably had the most visibility. The great increase in online transactions has contributed to resilience of supply chains and could offer future growth opportunities, particularly for micro, small, and medium enterprises. Our members are deeply involved in talks on enabling e-trade principles, including uh, data management and uh, uh, the, secure, uh, the uh, cyber security, this kind of uh, principles. We have also worked towards solutions through our own aid for trade mechanism, which involves many stakeholders and in partnership with, for example, ANCTA's e-trade for all initiative. Indeed, our e-commerce e talks gain new urgency due to the pandemic. We have conducted a dialogue with the private sector and NGOs such as consumer associations and have sponsored seminars and the workshops on topics ranging from trade-related data governance to e-health and fintech. The trends linked to the pandemic not only demonstrated the importance of economic sustainability and recovery measures, but also cast a harsher light on the challenges. It became clear that underserved populations and the developing countries needed more and better connectivity. So we have a framework covering global sub, uh, supply of communication services, but it, it will also require moving ahead, hand in hand with many other institutions and stakeholders. Thank you. Well, thanks a lot. Uh We've been discussing the role of, of the public administration and uh, it appears that most of the panelists are, 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 are a little bit uh, uh, aware of the fact that things are not going as they should. So, Mr. Trujillo, you are, you are private, you are the market. And so uh, and you, made, you made a case for digitalization of licensing and, and, and permitting for better public and private governance. Uh, and that would help the resiliency towards the COVID pandemic. Um, but how can this be done? How, how do you see it from your own experience, from the experience of your very large company? Thank you for your question. The, the first point would be to keep it simple. Uh, so one of the greatest impediments for government, uh, governmental adoption, I would say, uh, has been that it's complex and costly. Uh, that means having some faith that if you do core digitalization work, it realigns incentives and capabilities in a way that makes additional improvements easier. So that would be number one. Secondly, um, uh, heads of uh, state of the Western Hemisphere committed at the last summit of the Americas to work on best practices and asked for coordination. So we in the Americas Business Dialogue have been part of a multilateral process coordinated by the Organization of American States, which uh, has settled on five best practices. Number one is all rules and fees uh, are online. Number two is pay and renew online as well. Uh, number three, digital single window for application, processing and external monitoring of progress. Number four, impact mitigation requests must be disclosed online to be binding. And finally, number five, training and, and certification of key personnel regarding how to do these best practices. Uh, the last point that I would like to make is the, the, what, we call, what is called the Trust in Business Initiative of the OECD. 
uh, once you have set of best, if you have a set of best practices, certifying both the agencies that successfully implement and professionals who are trained uh, in the best practices creates a virtuous circle, boosting hiring and retention of well-trained people and giving those people an incentive to push Asian agencies uh, to be certified. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Truillo. Um, the market is important uh, and, and, and the market in some regions, especially the small businesses are at risk right now. Uh, Mr. Kitui, uh, uh, watching the problem from the point of view of ANCTAD, I would be happy to ask you uh, which are the real policies, the policy areas that require cooperation, that require the cooperation of all the stakeholders. But before that, there's something you said before, and, <clears throat> and you said that you need uh, the internet and the digital development uh, to help foster trade and commerce. But I was wondering whether this could harm uh, the small businesses and the small shops uh, in, in, in the African uh, countries. So isn't it, isn't it, it is definitely an opportunity, but maybe it's also a risk. What do you think about it? All right, <laughs> Th thank you very much. Uh, of course, the nature of trade is always determined by what is the quality of products that's being traded. If it's end consumer products, particularly those that are also competing with local produce, then efficiency in arrival of digitally procured goods can put pressure on locally produced goods. But many times what we see is <clears throat> there's, there's part of that as a challenge. In fact, uh, our study shows that many startup internet trading companies, logistics companies, find it much easier to facilitate imports than exports for developing countries. I suppose part of that is the fact that uh, there is the fear of rejected return goods, which is mitigating how much you produce new products from developing countries in the world, more sophisticated markets. But be that as it may, I think the main challenges we face are the following. Many small and medium enterprises in the developing world have been finding themselves niches and opportunities in global supply networks, global value chains, into which they provide a service or a product. And so where we are, what should be directly concerning is that in the days of the pandemic, it's basically an inflection point in what was already happening in the world. Uh, a combination of technology and economic nationalism have seen a major disruption in global supply networks, with most production networks now being more localized domestically or in shorter regional uh, contexts. And that means that as the trends in investment become shorter distance geographically, as the content of investment becomes footlight, opportunities for small businesses and policymakers in developing countries have to realign to that new reality looking more for niches in more regional supply networks and more domestic markets than in the traditional sense of single profit seeking long distance investment patterns. I think that's one important area that, that, that has to be appreciated. But there's the other area. It is not possible to grow a regime of consumer protection and logistics facilitation without international cooperation because by the very nature of uh, the growing importance of digital uh, commerce, uh, there's need for strengthening protection of consumers, particularly when some people have been taking advantage of the strain and the urgency of the pandemic period to charge uh, scarcity profits on uh, either PPE requirements or urgent uh, produce that is needed to mitigate the impact of the pandemic. Uh, and, and I think this is an area of cooperation. Similarly, we need enhanced international cooperation if we can mitigate the very, very extreme disruptions of global hospitality industry and the related services. And whichever components can be digitalized, uh, assurance of quality and the standards of hospitality taking care of the pandemic 
are going to be important in the recovery of hospitality industry and the rapid sciences. Well, thank you, Secretary General. I just uh, uh, call your attention to a written question we've had uh, from the floor on, on, on the role uh, of, of, of um, women in Sierra Leone, which we cannot take now, but I would ask you if you can answer it uh, on the floor later after this, this session ends. That would be more than welcome. Thank you. And so uh, we have rules, so we are asking for projects, and, uh, and Dr. Marcel, again, to have a, 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 a better and more fluid and more efficient flows of, of uh, uh, flow of capitals, uh, which kind of policy recommendations uh, would you would you suggest? Would you ask for in order to step forward and 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 give the world a better a better pattern of growth? Thank you for that question. In a sense, what uh, must happen is that policy and policy formulation has to catch up with what is actually happening in the world because we have had for at least two decades a situation where the geography of innovation has in fact changed, but policy recommendations and policy frameworks still treat the structure of innovation and the structure of finance in a very uh, outdated fashion. And so we should be updating our frameworks and mindsets vis-a-vis -vis knowledge flows. We should be thinking about multipolar geographies rather than a single technology frontier. We should be focusing on bi-directional flows of knowledge as opposed to old fashioned technology transfer mindsets. And to illustrate, I want to give some examples of successful companies that have emerged during the pandemic period. And so you have companies such as Diatropics in Senegal, which is coming up with a very affordable testing kit. You have Tafari Capital and Technologies in South Africa that has developed a COVID tracing app, both for Lesotho and um, and South Africa. You have Zilliqa that has come up with digital currencies in the, in the Caribbean. You have a number of examples of small venture companies as well as large companies that have actually pivoted and used this inflection point uh, beneficially. And I also want to make a point about where I think there is a real role for policy intervention vis-a-vis -vis the investment flows. I mentioned before that in the pandemic, you've had a tremendous increase in responsible investing, some 275% increase, so that you have $7.1 billion of investments, which are viewed as having a responsible investing uh, strategy. But that is still only less than 5% of all investment flows. Well, and thank that's sorry. Okay, thank you, Dr. Marcel. And again, we are nearly on schedule. And Dr. Anderson, IMF, uh, I mean, we have heard a lot of of, of interesting suggestions. Uh, and I mean, you are such a big stakeholder and I, uh, I'm asking you, uh, how should uh, stakeholders rethink their cooperation, if they have to do it as it seems, around the internet governance for a better economy recovery? I mean, uh, what should we do now different to make it better? Yeah, it's clear that the role and the impact, but also the expectations of digitalization from governments and citizens alike compared to pre-COVID have changed significantly. In fact, the situation is so different, it's probably fair to, to talk about a digitalization 2.0 era. The question becomes, how do we get the best of digitalization 2.0? And instead of watching digitalization developed, unequally as it did, or as we saw with version 1.0, which was the pre-COVID version, 
Can the international community shape its trajectory and not let a crisis go to waste? At the IMF, we're seeing a once in a lifetime opportunity to quote, build forward better, end quote. A world that's fairer, greener, and smarter. And the internet and technology play a central role to build this better world. For example, a fairer world is one where women who have been more impacted than men during the crisis, as I said before, have equal access to the internet. Did you know that in the last seven years, the gender digital divide has become worse, not better for the least developed countries? So governments and the international community must come together to look at how we can empower women with connectivity and digital finance in particular. Programs like Navisa in Togo, for example, have targeted mobile cash transfers to women. Tanzania and Zambia have experimented with free phones to the poorest women with great results. It just makes economic sense. We know that the expanding internet access in Sub-Saharan Africa by 10% of the population could increase real uh, per capita GDP growth by as much as four percentage points. Finally, and I'll conclude with this, more than ever, stakeholders must address the issue of the 46% of the globe that still doesn't have access to the internet. And the private sector will be instrumental in this post-COVID world. Take, for example, the organizations that are building and deploying low orbital satellites, companies like SpaceX. In less than two years, they will cover every inch of the earth with high bandwidth internet, assuming electricity is available. And there's another, and that's another priority for digitalization 2.0, which is availability of electricity. These low orbit satellites could leapfrog millions out of poverty in just a few years. It could be a game changer, but it has to be done in coordination with the public sector and international organizations and it has to be done in a manner that is fair, smart, and green. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Anderson. And I mean, it's great. We are only two minutes out of schedule, which is a great performance for, for this governance forum. And so I, I take the chance to give back the floor to uh, each and one panelist uh, uh, for, let's say, a voluntary commitment or voluntary commitments uh, on, on behalf of their own individual or institution, just to say in less than one minute, the last word for the day, which of course is going to be different from the one you're going to pronounce tomorrow, but this is the game we are playing. So uh, uh, let's start again from the beginning in less than one minute. Uh, uh, Mr. Harrison, African Union. Uh, uh, okay. How do you feel? Tell us. Thank you, thank you. For, for Africa, the cooperation between government, private sector, and partners is crucial. So I continue to mobilize them to accelerate the implementation of digital transformation strategy for Africa. I thank you. Accelerate the, the, the implementation. Yes, we shall. Dr. Brunstrup, uh, Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs and Energy, Germany. What's your take? Mike on? Uh, Mike on? Yes, you are. I'm, I'm sorry, I think we have a te technical problem here. Can you hear me? Yes, of course, of course. You, you can hear me? Yes, of course. Yes. Okay. Uh, I, I'm sorry for, for that. Uh, I That's couldn't right. hear you for a moment, so I, I'm not sure if I, I got the right question, but uh, uh, maybe as my final points, I would like to say how, how honored Germany was hosting the IGF last year and that we are still very much committed in advancing the progress um, that we are making in the international community, bringing forward all the international discussions on bringing forward the IGF um, we have been the facilitator in the process of recommendations 5A and B, and we are still very much in favor of bringing into the discussion parliamentarians, so the decision makers all over the world. Uh, there was a session yesterday where our parliamentarians uh, um, made the offer to coordinate a process with parliamentarians all over the world. 
to bring them together with the discussions in the IGF. Um, and I would like to underline that and thank you all very much for the discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you to you, Dr. Brunstrup, and thank you to your government. Um, Under Secretary uh, Eskap, uh, Ali Shabana, what's your final word for today? Yeah, uh, ESCAP is very much committed to accelerate and scale up the implementation of the Asia-Pacific Information Superhighway Initiative through one, support member states to enable government policy for accelerated digitalization, second, to promote women's economic empowerment by increasing access to finance and digital technologies especially those in LDCs, LLDCs, and SITs. Third, to encourage young and social and innovators and entrepreneurs to leverage technology and innovative solutions. Thank you. I mean, thank you. Um, Mr. He, WTO, World Trade Organization, the floor is yours. Thank you. I think from our previous uh, experiences, we can envision new and practical digital economy solutions that can help promote economic recovery and job creation. It is also clear that global communication uh, networks have demonstrated their role in the delivery of essential services and our outreach to less connected communities. We are convinced that trade rules and principles are not an obstacle, but are part of the solution. WTO can offer a path toward greater predictability, interoperability, trust, and lower costs for both businesses and consumers. I can only underscore the need for greater collaboration to facilitate cross-border movement of goods and services, narrow the digital divide and level the playing field for developing countries and small and medium enterprises. Thank you. Well, a, a, a level playing field is definitely needed. Uh, Mr. Tuiu, Walmart, the floor is yours. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, I would like to mention two things. The first one, the America's Business Dialogue Commitment. We have already signed on the dotted line to commit to a public-private multilateral partnership that provides technical assistance and financial resources to governments that wish to implement the digital license permits uh, pra best practices. Uh, I invite governments to make their interests known. That would be number one. Um, as well, I, will, I, I am proud to be a founding corporate member at the Trust in Business Initiative of the OECD. And we have made a strong commitment to pair private sector compliance best practices with these public governance reforms that I've described before. Thank you very much. Well, thanks to you. And uh, Mr. Kitui, it, it's up to you. Well, thank you very much. I uh, very much uh, want to associate myself with the efforts that we can find through dialogue, methods of building sustainability because of shared benefit. Um, the crisis of multilateralism today is because of the unequal benefits from multilateralist uh, globalization. And I think that should be a lesson as we enter the digital era that a fairer distribution of the benefits, clearer development of competition policy that addresses questions of uh, gobbling up of adjacent businesses by uh, major platform companies, better distribution of the benefits and the value of global digital economy are going to be important. But I think going forward, we must also do more evidence-based ass assessment of the impact of digital economy on gender. Uh, vulnerable groups, particularly women groups in transitional societies, what has happened and what could be done better. Evidence-based affirmative progressive action is going to be necessary to make us generally say that we are sh sharing an agenda and a vision for a world driven by new opportunities. Well, thank you. And again, Dr. Marcel, your floor. Thank you so much. And thanks to the IGF for the invitation. I wanna congratulate you on setting up a forum where we can actually continue to advocate for 
systems and mindsets that allow us to think about the ways in which we can mobilize capital, including financial capital, to ensure that we have sustainable human development that tackles intersectional areas of social injustice, as well as mobilizes financial investments for digital infrastructures and also for digital societies. And so my commitment is to continue to be involved in the design of those strategies, as well as advocating for those ways of conducting ourselves in the international community. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Uh, Mr. Anderson, IMF. Uh, so again, thank you, uh, Marco, and thank you, IGF. Um, we've now entered a, the era of internet of value where payments and monies are exchanged almost as easily as information. Some countries are accelerating the adoption of digital monies, for example, with uh, CBDC, uh, central bank digital currencies. But as I said before, not all countries have the same access to the internet and to digital skills. So we're facing the risk of balkanization, not only of the internet, but of the internet of value. The IMF is working with others, the BIS, the CPMI, the FSB, the WB, and we're committed to making cross-border digital payments as equitable and safe and as green as possible. Once again, thank you and thank you to the IGF. Well, thanks everybody. I mean, we made a sort of miracle. We are a little bit ahead of schedule. So I will take the three minutes that remain or even less to sum it up. I mean, it's been an interesting panel here and in the, on the occasion of the 15th annual uh, IGF, the Internet Governance Forum organized by the UN. And we're living a very, a very painful uh, and, and, and dangerous crisis. But what we used to say is that we should never waste a good crisis or a bad crisis in order to make ourselves and our economy a better places. So uh, we have the impression that uh, the digital is something that will save us, which is true, but it is not completely true because it is not the only solution. We must think big and wide and look beyond the walls and we shall invest in digitalization from what you said. But at the same time, we must remind that the world is made of people, which is something that Dr. Marcel was clearly saying before. Therefore, uh, digital should be aimed at education and digital should be aimed at uh, fostering investments uh, and make them uh, uh, arrive in the right place. And there's a need, as was underlined by the speaker from Walmart, and, and among the other speakers as well, in, including Mr. Kitui, there's a need of e-governments working in a better way, uh, which means providing digital solutions and digital services in, in, in the most uh, uh, efficient uh, and, and, and resilient way, way in order to be made available to uh, everybody. Uh, there's a problem of, 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 of taxation as well. Taxation should be good to redistribute uh, uh, income and, and, and welfare itself, but should not be, uh, uh, let's say, strangling those who are smaller. They should be able to get... get into the market. I would use the quote, keep it, I would add, uh, keep it quick and, and, and be fast and be more pragmatical than political. Uh, you all are a part of, of, of the world. You're all engaging your lives to make the world a better place. Be more pragmatical and more efficient than political. And maybe we'll get out of it in a better solution, in, in a better situation as we hope right now. So uh, from, from Claudi Torino uh, in the Northwestern Italy and my office here at La Stampa, I thank all the participants for being here today. I won't name them again. Now you're great friends and you can continue your, your, your uh, attending, I mean, I mean, meeting yourself in, in, in the forthcoming occasions. And I thank the uh, IGF for this opportunity for me to chair this very relevant and important meeting. And I wish you all the best for this uh, pandemic. It's not 
going to be easy. But I think that with a little bit of, of effort, a little bit of wisdom and a little bit of work, we'll get out of it safe and, 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 and soundly. So again, see you in a new uh, occasion. All the best. Thanks, everybody. And thanks to both who have been listening to us. This is the end. Go home and be happy.